So here we are again in the engine build room. New tool, well it's not new, but a new tool for you to see. Um, so this is a valve spring tester. So the bottom platform measures the pressure and then the top platform's adjustable with this wheel. And on the front of it, I can see how much we've compressed the spring. So you might hear people talk about something called valve float. Uh, and that is essentially normally seen on the exhaust side of a turbo car and it's where your valve gets out of control where your spring doesn't have enough pressure to deal with the back pressure in the exhaust manifold um, and it's basically it's floating it doesn't shut fast enough it doesn't follow the cam or the lifter on its closing stroke uh, you also get valves out of control when you up the RPM um, so we don't normally see RPM issues. Um, we see broken springs on some of the race engines we do, some of the GT3 LMS engines we do, um, but that's a balance of service life and shifting. Uh, they don't have overrun protection, as in downshift protection, so they can they can go beyond the limiter, they can downshift and buzz the limiter. Um, and you can jump rockers or you can break springs. Uh, for our program, for our twin turbo stuff, we go from a stock spring to an uprated spring. Um, it's not horrific, but it just helps give us that control, uh, especially on the exhaust side. So what you first have to do is you have to measure something called uninstalled and installed height. So if you can imagine when the valve is sat in a cylinder head, you put the spring and the retainer on the valve won't protrude through. So we have a difference in height between the top of the valve stem and the top of the retainer. So that's our uninstalled height. Then on the flip side of that, once it's installed, so the spring is compressed, the retainer's on and the locks are on, you then get the protrusion sat through the top of the retainer. So that's our installed height, or rather that's the installed difference. So we measure from top retainer to top of the valve, and the same then when it's uninstalled. And we get our, we then get what's called as your seat height or your installed height. We've cut the seats on these and we've ended up with 7.3 mil, both inlet and exhaust. So basically what that means is the spring is preloaded 7.3 mil from, un, from uncompressed. That's our installed height or our seat so what we're going to do is, is we're going to find where that is and then this little gauge here is going to tell you what the pressure is. So we're about there. So if we zero that, zero that. Both inlet and exhaust are the same. So we're at 7.3 mil. Um, so we are going to sit and wind on Tune a bit. Four, five, six, seven. We'll go seven point five, and then we'll come back just so the gauge is sat right. Seven point five, seven point four, seven point three, five, four, three, two, one, zero. 7.3 and we've got 43 pounds of spring pressure. So that is a stock and an exhaust at stock. Right, from there we'll just do, in this instance I'll just do a comparison. So I'm going to add 10 mil of valve lift to this spring. So I'm going to zero my gauge out again and I'm going to put 10 mil on. So when the cam is compressing the opening above 10 mil, what do we get to? We get 5, 4, 3, 2, 122.4, so at 10 mil of lift, 
is 122.4 pounds. Then the next important measurement is what's coil bind. So when you get to coil bind, that is when you compress the spring so much that there is nothing else to give. You've clamped the spring up solid. So we need to know what that measurement is. So we're gonna to go to coil bind and I'm gonna tell you how much you can take a stock spring, what, what coil bind is in a stock spring. So we keep winding that up until we get, and then all of a sudden, so there you go, for example, now I am at 14 mil and I'm at 164 pounds of pressure. And then all of a sudden, we're gonna hit reach coil bind and this gauge is just gonna take a huge jump. There it is. So if we come back to a reasonable number, so we're creeping, 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 spring pressure's creeping. All of a sudden I can feel a handle go tight. We literally just go to over 220. So we're about, about 14.5. So 14.5 mil is coil bind on that spring. And that is at 168 pounds. So providing our valve lift doesn't exceed or get close to that, the spring's safe. So that's a stock spring. I'm going to wind it back off. Right, do the same with the outrated spring. So we'll do the same again. Sit it in, bring our gauge down, just till we get a little tweak. There you go, like a feeler gauge, just kind of want a little bit of gentle drag. Zero, zero that. Right, so we need to go the same again, which is 7.3. Six, 7.2, come back a bit. Nine, five, two. 7.3 and we're at 72.8 so instantly you can see the difference so that's called seat pressure so we've got nearly 30 pounds more seat pressure so again zero the gauge we're going to add 10 mil of lift so this is 10 mil of cam lift we're gonna see where we get to. All right, 10.1, 10.05, 04, 02, 01, 10 mil. 183.6, so at 10 mil left, we're now 60 pounds over. Remember, they're both the, both the same, so this would be the same as well. So we're now, we've got at 10 mil of lift, at valve lift, we've now got 60 pounds more pressure than stock spring. So 14.5 mils coil bind. So do we have less or more coil bind, to, less or more room to work with? Do we run into coil bind sooner or later? We is it no it's just taking a massive jump so we come back 225 230 240 250 260 280 500 so where do we get to a reasonable number 13.4 13 so we've got 13.4 mil at 225 pounds. So we've got more pressure on the seat, we've got more pressure in the spring, but we've got a mil less 
mill less of spring clearance. So we run into coil bind a mill sooner or 1.1 mil sooner. So what that means is now we need to, we would assemble a valve train. We would put soft springs in, in place of these. We'd build at the time and assembly, we'd rotate the engine and we would figure out how much lift we actually have. Now we know that anyway, because we know the roller rocker, the rocker ratio, so the ratio of the rocker arm, and I know my cam lobe duration, so we can figure it out, we, we can do the math that way, but we always back it up, we always do a physical check in the same way that you do your bearing clearances and you do all the maths, but it's still nice to put a bit of plastic gauge in there and just get a visual representation that you haven't cocked up the numbers. Um, so it's the same kind of thing. So we would then, I would put soft springs in, uh, put soft springs in, put lifters in, put the cams in. I would put a DTI gauge on the top of my retainer and I'd turn my top end over and make sure I don't run anywhere near coil bind because you can, what I was saying to you earlier about shimming the springs to get more pressure. If I put say a one mil shim in there again and I bring it down to 12 and a half and our, we're getting close in with our valve lift, that means I've got 12 and a half mil at coil, coil bind and say I'm getting 11.8 mil a lift, you're starting to, you're just gonna start running into coil bind. And the second you coil bind a spring, you you have you you can't compress it anymore. That is it. You were done. Um, so then you've got a cam trying to push down and a spring completely locked up. Uh, and in this case, the the tap it and the the roller rocker it was just blown to bits, blown to bits. So that is what we do. That's a everyone goes on about the materials in the spray in the valves and yes, there's a lot of engineering it goes in to make sure the valves fit in the head and the guides are honed right. Um, but this is probably one of the most important things on the valve train is what the spring's doing. You get your spring calculations wrong and it'll eat your valve train. It'll absolutely hammer the living shit out of it. To give you an example, <laughs> pro mod cars are running 800 pounds on the spring. I don't even think any of our, <laughs> nothing would take 800 pounds of pressure. So different engines require different um, different valve train. We've gone this way because when we turbo it, we're not using more RPM, we use less RPM, but we're having to battle, especially uh, we're putting boost in. So your inlet valves now not fighting atmospheric pressure, it's fighting boost pressure to close. And your exhaust manifold pressure, the logging we've got on that out of the MoTeC, because we log that, um, yeah, it's pretty scary. <laughs> You think um, you think boost pressure gets high. They're not running big boost on on the stuff over here, but exhaust manifold pressure goes through the roof, um, and that's what a spring has to fight against. And if you get it wrong, you get a car that doesn't run very nice, and you start damaging parts, and you start damaging engines, and you lose performance. So, yeah, it's taken us it's taken us a little while to do the math to figure it all out. We deal with good manufacturers who who help. We tell them what we want, what we want to do, the numbers, we tell them the boost pressure, you know, the crankcase pressure, the exhaust manifold pressure, the compression ratio, that sort of thing. And they'll come back and go, well, right, well, we think you need to be at this sort of pressure level, spring pressure. Um, you know, they'll help us with things like the materials the valve should be made of, depending on what exhaust gas temperature we're seeing, stuff like that. So, um, yeah. you rely on their experience as well we just you know that's what they're there for so um it's pretty hopefully that's not too complicated or i haven't blown people's heads but that's the simple representation of what that little dude goes through uh and how we measure it out that little dude goes through an awful lot wow. gets battered the shit out of to put it in technical terms. Oh, mate. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, do you know what? We'll I'll, I'll dig out the springs I took out of Simon's Lambo. So the blue Lambo we built, done 106,000 miles. It lost 30% of spring pressure. 30%. So it 
So I took a stock Lambo spring, I measured it, I took Simon's worn spring, the height was different, the heat cycles had shrunk, had basically allowed the spring to compress and it wouldn't return, and then the pressure was gone. So that's it. Something you're not really gonna worry about in a road engine, um, but when we're kind of building this stuff, or one of those little guys fails, you can write the motor off. Being realistic, you could. Um, you know, you drop valve heads, Christ. 10 years ago doing super sport, you know, we were revving our sixes and stuff to what, 16,000 RPM. One of those little guys drops a valve head, take the engine out of the bike and put it in a bin. You know, it had a valve life. We were running them close, we were running them high RPM um, and they got battered. And that's the balance. You can have it, you know, cheap, fast or reliable, pick any two. So we do fast and reliable, but in good quality parts, you know, and they work well. Um, who, who do you work with, Rick? Uh, so these are by Supertech. Okay. So we deal with William Supertech. Um, you know, it's it's important to have a good relationship there. Uh, we would we went with one material spec uh, on one of the first engines we did, um, and as we pushed the car on, I was getting uncomfortable with the exhaust the exhaust valves uh, for where we were with the car's performance. Uh, we went back and had another conversation and this is why we've ended up on Inca now. Um, they're standard, they're sodium filled. So they're steel valves sodium filled um, to try and help. But yes, yeah, all development, it all moves forwards. I mean, it's, um, I don't know anyone else in the UK building V10s, uh, certainly not like what we do, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, it's been interesting four years, sort of getting them to, getting them to this level. Absolutely. So I think people don't see the amount of late nights and all the oh, development oh, work that goes into this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I sat, you, you go for it and even down to, um, we took the two variators. Uh, I had two old ones. Oh, what a low part. That was the missus on the phone. Oh dear. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> right. Sorry. Um, well, we took a pair of variators. And then what we did was uh, we degreed the crank, uh, and then for that degree of crank rotation, <laughs> sorry man, right. um, for that degree of crank. Hey mate, it's all light. This is how it yeah. works, right? Never work with was it they say kids and animals? Yeah, right. Um, for every degree of crank rotation, then we had cam lift on exhaust and inlet, and then what we did was we started to move our cam timing adjusters, well, we machined them so we could put screws in and adjust them. And then we could do it by one degree of cam timing movement. We could then build ourselves like a 3D table of where my timing mark, timing values were for each cam rotation, if that makes sense. So what my valve, my, my valve lift profile was under each cam timing permutation for each crank degree. So we worked that out. Um, and then with that, and you, you draw in with your piston to valve clearance, you can start to understand where your engine's safe, what cam timing numbers you can run, whether you can run it all and you have no risk or whether you have zero, you have big risk, you know, cause at some point you're gonna get the piston and the valve at certain times are in the same area. So you need to make sure you've always got safe clearance and that's, that's a lot of the work people don't see. That picture, building that picture up um, to understand, right, okay, on the dyno, I know I can push this cam timing or this or this. And it might be that you can run it and there is no issue, but I'd rather do the writing down and the working out now than push too hard and find out the wrong way that I've nipped a valve or I'm in an area the engine doesn't like to be in I know my squish, I know my piston protrusion, I know my piston to valve clearance. So once I build an engine, I know where I can go. And this was a big point for getting a dyno, was one, we were either relying on other people to tune our work, um, which we were picky about who we chose, but there's always a risk. And two, then, if I went and hired someone else's dyno, so like we hired a dyno, Charlie's dyno at Peron, we've hired his dyno before, you're paying per hour to test things. 
and that's not what I wanted. So like the blue VMAX car, I, I reckon that has probably done 200 hours on my dyno. Wow. Well, me just sat there dicking around, testing things, trying this, trying that. Um, you, you know, to know. It's why we've gone and bought a combustion pressure sensor so we can understand what is actually going on inside the engine. What we're pushing uh, cylinder pressure wise because it's all an unknown. It's calculated, but it's nice to back that up with actual data. And there's nothing worse than, no, the only thing worse than no data is bad data. Um, so yeah, we've gone and bought that so we can do pressure waves on the inlet port, pressure waves on the exhaust port and cylinder pressure. So maybe yeah. we can have a look at that in another video. Yeah, I think that, I think that, that. Yeah, I think it'd be quite cool to do that. So we've got, yeah, it's a Plex combustion analysis module. And um, also have a look at the, the dyno itself. Cause I think we've, we've shown some cars on the dyno, but we've not had a proper conversation about how you run it and yeah that'd be um put chuck something on there and just just go through it i mean even down to how we strap it on the fan work and the ducting and you know it's um yeah every day's a school day i uh, i do not profess to to know it all and i think if you talk to a lot of people in this game who who know way more than me they'll tell you for every question you answer you find three more questions and i, I kind of like that that's if i could sit here and just geek out all day and just do the things I want to do, then that's cool, that's the dream job, right? Just play around and this is it. Between this and doing a dyno data, we'll have to go through some data off to Interbo and you know stuff like that, I think it's pretty cool. That would be good, we look at the um, the MoTeC and obviously we've got Cybex that yeah, you, yeah. you work with yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean we did unboxing videos, um, yeah. which again shows you the hardware, what your money buys you, but yeah, maybe we'll go through some of the software stuff and go through some of the data or the calibration side, what you can change, um, you know, that sort of thing. That'd be pretty cool. Good. And I think um, anybody who's been tuning in and watching the videos on the channel, we've been starting to put more stuff up recently. We're doing more techie stuff, which I know is what you're really into. Um, if, the, if there's anybody watching this, if they've got any ideas, some videos they might want to see or some tech info that you could, you could provide, um, they can DM, they can reach out to us. Yeah, that, that'd be quite cool actually. If, if I suppose we sit there and come up with ideas of what we think we want to do. Um, we've got some gearboxes lying around, so that's probably a cool one to do, show the inside of like an L140 or DL800. Um, but yeah, what do you guys want us to see? I mean, I used to do like late night walk rounds and put them on, on live, but you know whether people want to see that it'd be yeah put in comments some ideas what you want to see and hopefully it's interesting that's all that's all i want it's stuff that interests me and hopefully other people see it as well that's cool and finally we want to get people subscribing yeah so wait, where'd you put a button what's a button go? i don't know yet it could be up there it could be down there as give long away as like, it's there somewhere yeah yeah that's it should we give away something what can we give away an R8? Yeah. There's enough here. <laughs> 14 accounted Saturday. 14 R8s. Two Lambos. Yep. What have I got? Two Lambos, 14 R8s. Uh, what else we got here? A TR6, GT, TR3, GT6, two Gardos. Uh, a RS3, uh, 68 Charger. Yep. C63, couple RS6s. Uh, and I counted four RS6s. Four RS6s, yeah. four V10s. Cool, I think of all the cylinders that are here. <laughs> Maybe that's that, that could be a question. How many cylinders are caught? currently at RE Formance? And then we need to give something away, whether it's uh, some merch or. We'll have a think about that. I got a piston and rod someone can have. Yeah. An old rod, rod and piston out of a. I was thinking of doing that. I mean, at one point, I must have had like 80, 90 pistons sat here. And um, uh, my mates at Owens, they've got a laser engraver. So I was going to do like um, uh, piston paperweights, like running through a hot wash tank and then get them laser engraved on the top. So. Pretty cool. Yeah, I think so. And make some money somehow, mate. Well, that's <laughs> it. <laughs> Selling, how do you become a millionaire? You sold old pistons. Job done. But. Okay, buddy. Thanks for that. Thank you very much. See you in the next one. See you in a bit.